we request sir to kindly address the gallery many many thanks to all of you for joining today i wanted this program as informal as possible and i want to take as many questions as possible from you so feel free to ask any question that you have in your mind few days ago i was in hyderabad and suddenly i got a request from a student he wanted to meet me so he came and uh, told me that he was my student some 12 years ago electrical engineering at iit delhi so i asked him what are you doing now he said uh, i am producing biscuits i have a company which makes biscuits using millets and it's a popular uh, biscuit brand in south india it is available on online platforms the reason why i have given this example is that what you will become in future may not be related to what you are studying now and this will become increasingly more and more true as technologies develop as human societies evolve 50 years ago one could predict what kind of jobs will come after 10 years but today it's very difficult to predict what kind of jobs will come and what kind of skills are required so obviously if you are specializing in a very narrow domain and studying for 3 4 years by the time you pass out of your college your skills may not be really useful for the kind of jobs that are coming and that's the reason why it is important for you not to stick to any single domain you may have interest in a particular domain maybe physics maybe economics maybe commerce engineering medicine whichever discipline it is but you should also study additional subjects to broad base your knowledge and that is the whole idea of our national education policy to introduce to you multidisciplinary education and then in olden days for example when i was a student at iit madras when our teacher prescribed a textbook we used to go to the library read that textbook and study but today you have multiple sources of information and in olden days when we were students the teacher will tell something on the blackboard will make notes go to hostel room study and come back but now we want to diversify the way you learn things the way you acquire knowledge so when you diversify the teaching learning methods that is what we call holistic education there was a uh, a shloka attributed to mahabharat it says holistic education means one fourth of education comes to the student from the teacher one fourth of education comes from critical thinking and one fourth of education comes from peer learning amongst you you learn and one fourth of education comes from experience your internship field work and so on so national education policy says that no longer no learning should be confined to the classrooms alone it should be diversified so i want to ask you a couple of questions and if anybody disagrees with that you can raise your hand i know all of you want to be learners that is why you have joined in this great college but is there anybody 
who doesn't want to become a good learner. Everybody wants to become a good learner. Is there anybody who doesn't want to think critically? There is nobody. Is there anybody who doesn't want to question the status quo? You are happy with how things are. You don't want to change anything. Is there anybody who wants to do that? Is there anybody who doesn't want to lead teams? Who doesn't want to become a leader? It may be a small group, you want to lead it. Or when you grow up, you want to lead some big organizations. Is there anybody who doesn't want to become a good human being? Nobody is raising your hands. So clearly these are the aspirations that are constantly playing in your mind. So how do we meet these aspirations? And that is the central objective of our national education policy. We want to, through by implementing this national education policy, we want to create an ecosystem where you will become good learners, critical thinkers, you will constantly keep questioning the status quo, you will have opportunities to take risks, and obviously when you take risks, there are great chances of failing also. And we want to create an ecosystem where failure is not seen as something negative. Failure is seen as part of your learning. And we want to create situations where you have the opportunities to build teams and lead right from your student days. And ultimately, if you look around, you will find that unless whatever we are doing, it creates a positive impact in the lives of other people, what we are doing becomes only self-centered. Remember that all of us are interdependent on each other. We are not isolated entities in the society. We need to collaborate with each other, cooperate with each other, help with each other, and create that positivity in the other's lives through our actions. And that is what is being a good human being. So the national education policy aims to create all these things so that our students will become great contributors to the growth of our country. There are three important things that we want to provide to the students in the educational institutions. Freedom. Freedom to choose what you want to study. Freedom for you to carry out research in, in the areas that you like to do. Freedom is one, number one. Flexibility. You know, today, if I study my 12th standard in commerce, let's say, I'm just taking it as an example. And I want to do my undergraduate study in mathematics. The university will say, you don't have mathematics in your plus two. How can you do mathematics? But we want to create this kind of flexibility. We don't want to confine our students to very rigid disciplinary boundaries. And then we want to provide a lot of choices. For example, in the four-year undergraduate program, which Delhi University is uh, implementing from this uh, coming academic session, let's say you are doing BA economics as a major, but you also want to do data analytics as a minor, or BSc in biology, but you want to do a minor 
in international relations, that should be a possibility. So you should have this flexibility, freedom, and choices in your education. That's the primary objective of implementing this national education policy. Dear students, there are a lot of reforms that are being introduced in higher education. But ultimately, it is you who will show a difference on the ground through your activities, through your education, through various kinds of things that you do. That's the reason why UGC has decided that we should meet the students, listen to them, learn from them, get the feedback, and if any course correction is required, implement that course correction so that the implementation of NEP 2020 is successfully done. And I am very glad that we are starting with SRCC and I would like to thank the principal for giving this opportunity. When we made this request, she readily agreed to this. This program is recorded. And this program will be posted on the social media of UGC. If you are not a follower of our Twitter or Instagram, please do become a follower and see what are the things that UGC is doing, posting there. You can see that. So I teach at um, IIT Delhi and um, I teach electrical engineering there. And it's always a pleasure when my students ask me questions in the classroom. Some of my best papers have come because my students ask me very probing questions. They didn't agree what I am teaching, what I am writing on the board. They questioned me. And that led to a lot of thinking and then it led to new knowledge. Today I am sure you will ask me lots of questions, lots of critical questions. Um, I'm sure something interesting will come out of these conversations. So I, I will not like to give a lecture on NEP. Rather, I would like to hear from you, um, take your questions, and then take this conversation forward. So any one of you who would like to ask the questions, you can raise your hand and we will take one by one. Morning, sir. I am Jatin from BA Honors Economics, second semester. Mm -hmm. Thank, first of all, thanks, sir, to get this opportunity to interact with you. Before this, I also interact with you through Twitter interaction called Sambar. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, sir. So, sir, NEP is a way towards prosperous education and future. But there are some, uh, but there are some problems and caution that students. Mm -hmm. So, I am here to produce this. First is about skill enhancement course, value additional course, and ability enhancement course. These courses are good for students, but this increase the burden on the student. Before the these courses, the student, uh, the normal classes for the student from 8:30 to 1 p.m. Now it reaches to 5 p.m. So the student left with no time to explore more things. My second question is about ABC. So ABC is a wonderful initiative to accumulate credit and UGC also working in awarding degree on the basis of credit have earned irrespective of minimum duration. But the problem arises here that university is not offering a single paper. For an example, if a, uni if a student from BA Honors Economics Semester 1 is doing from University A, and he wants to do the macroeconomics also from University B. So University B is offering the whole course of BA Honors Economics, not a single paper of macroeconomics. Okay. And my the last question is about National Digital University. Mm -hmm. Many students is uh, eager to uh, know when will the National, National Digital University open and what type of course it will introduce initially. Thank you, sir. Right. right. 
So his first question is about, uh, it's all right you are introducing a lot of uh, other courses, skill-based, um, ability enhancement courses and so on, but it will increase the burden on the student. You know, last month we announced what is known as the National Credit Framework. And in this National Credit Framework, we defined how much time does a student spend in studying, doing lab, or doing field work, and how to assign weightage to the effort put by the student. And that is what is called a credit. So in the National Credit Framework, we said that every semester, the student has to acquire a minimum of 20 credits. So in one year, 40 credits. And in a four-year undergraduate program, you will acquire 160 credits. That is the minimum. And that is true among all educational institutions. Even in IITs also, a minimum of 20 credits a student has to acquire. Now, depending on the ability and the interest of the student, if you wish to acquire more credits, you can acquire. You can have ability courses, you can have skill courses. So nothing is imposed on the student. The first three things that I said, freedom, flexibility, and choice, will still remain in this national credit framework. Okay, so don't worry about um, being overburdened. We know that different students have different capabilities, different kinds of um, inner potential. And we need to leave it to them to explore that inner potential and take additional credits wherever they feel like taking. And the other one is the ABC, Academic Bank of Credits. Academic Bank of Credits has multiple utilities, multiple applications. The simplest application of ABC, before I go to the complex example that you have given, is for all the students in a university, after you complete your first semester, your university is expected to upload the grades and transcripts and everything on the ABC portal. In the back end of the ABC portal, there is a digi-locker where all these documents are uploaded by your university. So whenever you want to see how many credits you have earned, you just go to the ABC portal, log in, and you can see. You are in second year. You want to see what, you, what was your progress in uh, first semester. If you are in a second semester, you can see that. So we are now insisting with all the universities that provide these documents on ABC so that for the students in any given university, they can check their progression through the ABC portal. And then after you pass out of the university, if some employer wants to verify your certificates, you don't have to carry your original certificates. They will be available on the ABC portal. Or from undergraduate program, you're going to a postgraduate program, and that institution wants to check your uh, transcripts, they will be available on the ABC portal. In fact, in the National Credit Framework, we are also envisaging that every child who joins in the school system will also be onboarded on the ABC portal. So by the time the child completes the uh, 12th standard, um, the child would have acquired 160 credits and those credits will be available in the ABC portal. And when you are going to Delhi University, Delhi University will check your credits there. You don't have to submit any other uh, documents. So that is the utility of ABC. And the second one is the advantage uh, that he has mentioned. Now, I want to take multiple courses from different universities. And these universities are all present on ABC. So it becomes easy to transfer the credits from University um, X to University Y with the ABC portal. Um, already now, more than one crore students are onboarded on the ABC. And many universities are in the process of uploading the transcripts and the grades, credits of the students on the ABC portal. And I would like to see Delhi University uh, to lead this ABC movement and become a role model 
for the rest of the country. Okay, and the other one that he want he is doing economics and he wants to do some other course related to economics, some advanced course related to economics. And this question is also related to the National Digital University. So we are now working on what is known as E Vishwavidyalaya. E Vishwavidyalaya will be established through an act of parliament and it will work like a hub and spoke model. The hub will have a small administrative team headed by a vice chancellor and it will also have a technical team. And each spoke will be some of the best institutions within the country in the first phase. Central universities, IITs, NITs and all such institutions um, will be part of this national digital university. And in the second phase, we will also invite even international universities to be part of this national digital university or e Vishwavidyalaya. And that is when you can choose any advanced courses on this e Vishwavidyalaya and, and then keep earning the credits and accumulate in the ABC, right? So all your three questions are related. I hope I have answered it to your satisfaction. So when will this university get involved? Right. So he's asking when will this e Vishwavidyalaya will be um, established? The, I said it will come through an act of parliament. The draft act of e Vishwavidyalaya is getting ready and uh, soon we will be placing it in the parliament and once it is passed, uh, the e Vishwavidyalaya will be established and hopefully uh, now that the new session is already starting and we are in the process of placing the act in the parliament, uh, hopefully from January session you will have the e Vishwavidyalaya courses uh, made available to you. And let me also tell you that there is going to be a lot of flexibility in the e Vishwavidyalaya. For example, UGC is already permitting you to do two degrees simultaneously. You can do one degree in D, uh, DU and another parallel degree on e Vishwavidyalaya. And conventionally, when we say a three year BA degree means three years or a four year, now a four year BA degree means four years a student is expected to study. But in the e Vishwavidyalaya, we are going to propose that the award of the degree should not be related to the duration. Suppose you have joined in a four year undergraduate program in e Vishwavidyalaya, you accumulate the required 160 credits in three and a half years, why not you get your degree? Why should you continue for fourth year? So it will be left to the student depending on your potential, your interest. You keep accumulating these credits. A four year undergraduate program, you try to complete in three and a half years or three years, it is up to you. Okay, right. So the next question. So, uh, so my, I'm Aditya Singh and I'm pursuing BCom honors from this college only and I'm a first year student. So my question to you uh, is rather a personal experience that I would like to share about the national education policy in my life. So I have to do seven subjects in just five months. And each subject we get almost four to five assignments. So that adds up to almost 30 to 35 assignments per semester. And uh, uh, checking it on the parameter of critical thinking, we don't even get the time of thinking about it because we just have to submit it and we just have to meet the deadline. And hence, it just goes on a very fast track. And uh, so the other parameter of leadership skills, uh, in uh, tier 2 and tier 3 cities, DU is the center of attraction because of its society culture, because they just play a very great part in our personal group, personality grooming. But since we have so much of academics to do and uh, projects to complete, uh, we fail to give our best in the societies that we are part of. And hence, uh, the, even the leadership skills some, sometimes go here by mm -hmm. And uh, thoughts are, uh, uh, because I too would like to pursue my hobbies, because university is a place to do that. But since we have so much of uh, uh, the, uh, the other things on academics part and the societies to do, we don't even get the time of doing it. Right. So this is my personal experience. I really don't want you to generalize it, but mm -hmm. I, I really want you to uh, show if I'm going wrong or is this the policy that can be improved some way. Thank you, sir. You are absolutely right. Um, as a student, you should not be 
just only bookish always study 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 you should participate in many other activities too it could be cultural it could be uh, sports and so on um, one of the things um, we are observing now is that uh, uh, before you come to the university you might have undergone a lot of training uh, to crack the entrance exams and so on and that makes you almost one dimensional but the world is not one dimensional it is multi dimensional so therefore you should acquire at least some of the hobbies that you like and pursue them and uh, with respect to the load academic load that we have we have now also introduced what is known as the multi entry multi exit um, it's a four year undergraduate program but you find that the academic load is too much you are not able to uh, give some of your time for other activities you want to prolong it by another semester or prolong it by another year it is completely up to you now you know one of the things in our indian society is that uh, we abhor failures we think that if somebody who has joined in a three year undergraduate program if if she does in uh, four years we think that person is a failure so we need to remove this idea this negativity associated with failure we should understand that every individual is unique they have their own individual capacities and uh, uh, capabilities and we should let them grow based on their capabilities instead of using one fits all kind of scale and say that this person is a failure this person is a success hello sir <coughs> I'm very honored to be speaking in front of you today. My name is Lal Nunpui and I'm currently pursuing BCom Honors first year. <clears throat> and sir, I would like to ask you your opinions on the AEC course, specifically regarding the decision on making Hindi language or any other language in the A schedule compulsory for students to learn because this has put many of us, including myself, as a disadvantage because we <clears throat> come from non-Hindi speaking states and our regional languages our mother tongue is not included in the option for us to learn the op the choice of options we have puts us at not a disadvantage but a double disadvantage because we cannot keep up with the level um, of hindi teaching that is hindi that is being taught here and the option for us to learn our mother tongue is not included in the <coughs> joint choices as well so i would like to ask you if there is any way for is for us to be accommodated uh, further that are facing this problem uh, right right yeah um very interesting question yesterday i was in uh, dehradun uh, to speak to participate in a debate on nep and the whole program was in hindi uh, my mother tongue is telugu uh, so i decided to speak in hindi although i i am not so fluent in hindi um because i am learning uh, hindi learning any new language or language with which you are not familiar is fun um that i part um the national education policy emphasizes on promoting our indian languages in our education and um, if you see the top 10 countries with the largest number of nobel prizes in all those countries kids study right from their school education to phd in their own mother tongue and if you look at the top bottom countries on the gdp ladder it is those countries who neglected their own indian their own native languages so and there is enough cognitive science research which has indicated that when children learn in their own mother tongue or local language in the early stages of their education they become more creative and that's the reason why the national education policy is emphasizing on using indian languages even in higher education but at the same time we are not saying that you neglect english no use english as a communication tool learn english 
as a communication tool, but use your own mother tongue or native language when you are studying the subjects. Recently, UGC also has sent uh, a circular to all the universities that if a student wants to write in their own local language, their answer script, please permit them to write. Provided, of course, the teacher knows uh, there are other practical issues that need to be looked into and then encourage the students to write in their own uh, mother tongue. And uh, with respect to your question, that there are so many languages in our country. Um, multiple languages are spoken. What comes very handy to us is the technology. The AI-based technology, um, which is being developed very rapidly. As I speak in English, what is your mother tongue? Okay. So, as I speak in English, or even if I speak in Telugu, you will hear the sound in real time in your own mother tongue. So these technologies are available and hopefully uh, as they become popular, as these apps will become popular, um, in, a, in a classroom in DU, perhaps she will be speaking in English, but 10 of you will listen in your own mother tongue. How wonderful it, will, it would be uh, if we can learn that way. So we are in a transition period things will develop. And we have also now uh, decided to bring out textbooks in Indian languages. UGC is also working on that. For undergraduate programs such as BA, BSc, BCom, we want to bring out about 1500 textbooks across the country in different states. And these will be posted on a portal launched by our Honorable President of India. And this portal is called eCumb. On eCumb portal, all these digital version of the textbooks in Indian languages will be available and you can download them. And whenever you find it difficult to understand um, in English, you can go to those books and try to understand. Let me tell you my own experience. Until 12th standard, I studied in Telugu medium. I hardly knew English. And when I went to the college, um, many of my friends, they were from city urban background and they were all speaking in English, I felt uh, uh, quite uncomfortable initially. But then I decided, let me learn English. Then I started reading newspapers, I started reading uh, English articles, and then I learned on my own, <laughs> right? So sometimes my kids laugh at me because my pronunciation of English words, because I learned it on my own, it's not, it's not correct. So, if you have the willpower to learn, you can learn many languages. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Dhruv Dukka. Uh, I'm a first year student at this college. So, my question is that NEP also focuses on imparting education uh, in the local languages to the elementary students. Uh, won't this act as a deterrent for the foreign students to enter uh, India? <coughs> And also, this, this can potentially impact the mobility of people across states. Right. Um, do you know how many people uh, know English in India? Less than 10%. And we are 1.4 billion people. People travel from south to north, north to east, east to west. We still communicate with each other. <laughs> right? Uh, so, it will not deter. And also, if you see the migration level of people, majority of the students who study in a particular state, they get employment locally. And those who go outside their state, they can always use other languages such as English to communicate with each other. So it should not act as a uh, deterrent. And now, you also said, Will it deter, discourage the foreign students to come and join here because we are teaching in our own local languages? We are imagining a situation that um, across India, in every college and uh, university, only Indian languages will be there. Our country is so diverse. You will have many universities where still English education will be there. You will have many colleges and universities where Indian languages will be used. And suppose, if you want to go and do a degree in Germany, they will insist that you first have, should have 
level A, level B, level C, German language knowledge, right? So we can also offer, if they are coming, let's say, to Tamil Nadu to join in Anna University, you can say, well, you pass level A, level B, level C, or whatever levels in Tamil, and then you come and join. So this way we can also promote our own languages. Greetings, sir. Uh, I am a first year student. My name is Aditya Singh. Uh, I am pursuing BCom honors. My question would be that that approximately 15.9% students drop out at the primary school level only, and an AP in its document has clearly mentioned the fact that it would be focusing upon curtailing dropout rates. So, sir, no clear procedure has been mentioned for the aforementioned aspect. So, right. how? What is the procedure, and how can we focus upon? Uh, degrading this 14.9% Correct. So, um, so this uh, school dropout is a challenge for us and it has multiple reasons. One is uh, the uh, financial reasons, uh, family reasons. Uh, so we need to tackle it in a multi-dimensional way. For example, the midday meal scheme that is being run uh, across the country that's an attraction for the kids to come to the school, right? Uh, so they, they are retained in the school. But later as they grow, um, there could be some family pressure. So therefore, they are dropping out to help the family. Or the family is not able to support the kid's education. So there are multiple reasons. It is not just only the education policy. So that's why if you look at the growth of our country today, Today we are the fifth largest economy and uh, our GDP growth also is uh, very high as compared to even the advanced uh, uh, countries like uh, US. So in, in, in the coming few years we will become the third largest economy in the world. So when that happens, the social status, the financial status of most of the Indians will improve and then they will be retained in the school, right? That is one. The other one is that within the school system itself, the teaching learning processes had to be improved. Foundational literacy, foundational numeracy, these are also important issues for us because the several surveys have shown that the students might have passed 10th class, but they cannot do simple maths. They cannot write simple sentence. So these are challenges that we need to address and that is why we have now come up with what is known as the National Curriculum Framework. So this National Curriculum Framework tries to address the challenges that you have pointed out and the change will not come overnight. It will take maybe next 5 years, 10 years. That is why National Education Policy has set a goal of 2035 by then through these multi-dimensional activities that we are implementing, both at the school level and the university level, hopefully the GER, Gross Enrollment Ratio, should go up to 50%. In fact, when we have this national digital university, we are anticipating that compared to the number of students in the physical universities and colleges, we will have even more students in the uh, National Digital University. Let me give you one simple example why. Today we have 4.1 crore students in the higher educational institutions. We have 1100 universities, um, we have 45,000 colleges. In next five years or so, this number is going to double. It may become 8 crores, it may become 10 crores. But within five years, will it be possible to build another 1100 universities, another 45,000 colleges, it's not possible. But we need to find a way to reach out to these young uh, uh, students across the country and that is where technology becomes very handy. We will be building world's largest e Vishwavidyalaya in India and we will have the largest number of students, not only Indians, but even foreign students in our e Vishwavidyalaya. Good morning, sir. So my name is Kushi Pandey. I am a first year student pursuing BCom honors. So my question to you is that what is the logic behind increasing the mark structure? Earlier it was 90 marks. Now it has been increased to 160. So what was the logic for this? 
And next question which I wanted to ask to you is regard to the education system. Mm -hmm. Why not our education system is based on the ability of student rather than based on the age? Thank you. Oh, okay. Ah, yes, why should it be age dependent? I completely agree with you. Uh, even a 60 year old can join in a college and study. Um, even a 12 year old, if the student has the capability, should be able to complete a degree program. <laughs> right? Leave it. That is why I began by saying that we need to give freedom, flexibility and choices to the students. Don't impose anything. Don't say that I have the structure and all students have to follow only this. Right? So, I, don't, I, I completely agree with you. And what was your first question? Increase in the marks structure. Okay. Um, you see, there is another thing that we want to do. Every university should have as much autonomy as possible. UGC doesn't want to micromanage by giving every rule and regulation to the universities. You know, a university is a center of so many intellectuals and so many young minds. They should sit together through appropriate processes, through um, discussion and debate. They should come up with schemes within the university and then implement. UGC will only provide the broader guidelines and within those broader guidelines, you should experiment um, within that and then implement it. So if your university has implemented something, uh, if you think that you know, this is too much, I think a debate and discussion should start uh, within your academic uh, bodies and then changes can be made. UGC doesn't interfere there. Good morning, sir. I am Mishika, pursuing Ecom Honours, a poster student. Right. So, uh, quite recently, I was having a discussion on, with one of my high school teachers about this new education policy and the changes being implemented at the high school level. Mm -hmm. So, what he mentioned was that there are a lot of changes being implemented, mm -hmm. but the teachers are not able to keep up with the changes because uh, for a very long time they've, they've been teaching the same day. Right. And now suddenly a change is being introduced. So, it's quite difficult for the teachers to actually teach that way. So, what are the like, majors and steps for the teachers? Being this is a very, very important uh, question that you have raised. In higher educational institutions, we have 15 lakh teachers. And in the school education system, we have nearly 65 boards, school boards across the country. And uh, we have 1 crore 5 lakh teachers in the school education system. And unless the teachers are trained in the new pedagogical approaches and uh, in using the technology in the teaching learning processes, um, it will be very difficult to see the change. So that is why since we deal with higher education in UGC, we are now going to come up with a plan known as Malavia Mission. And through this mission, in the next two years, we are working on training nearly 15 lakh teachers across the country. And I completely agree with you that the teachers also had to keep pace uh, with the changes that are happening. One thing that I would like to tell you is that um, you know, if somebody does PhD and joins in a university, we automatically assume that that person will become a great teacher, uh, which is not true. Even they need mentoring, they also need training. Um, our Indian educational institutions, therefore, must develop a cell within each higher educational institution where the teacher training is provided or new developments that are taking place in the pedagogical approaches, in the technology usage, um, they are provided to our teachers. Uh, so teachers also have to remain lifelong learners if they have to be effectively uh, teach their students. Right. So, so my question, uh, I am a BCom Honor student okay. uh, in the first year meeting some. And my first question is, uh, like you said, uh, E-Vishwa Vidyale, uh, is, uh, there is an option in that, that we can pursue our uh, three years course, maybe in, we can complete it in two years. Right. So, uh, in regular courses, this option should be made available. And like, uh, uh, option of research has been added in the four year uh, program.
of um, gra undergraduate programs. Mm -hmm. So uh, this should also be available in the three year program or uh, a student can start his research in the second year itself. Absolutely. Uh, now that we are just starting the four year undergraduate program with research component in the fourth year, let things stabilize uh, for a few years and then many of these experiments can be done. Now, just as we are giving the flexibility to the students to complete either earlier than the fixed duration or later than the fixed duration, um, do you want such a, such a uh, flexibility even in the degrees that you pursue in the physical mode? Will that be a good idea to have? Let's say I am doing a three-year um, BA economics and I want to complete in two and a half years. How will I do that? You can take up to 40% of your credits online. UGC has already permitted. So in, the, in your second year itself, first year itself, you take some additional online credits. And by the time you complete two and a half years, if you have acquired 120 credits, you should be able to complete your degree, is it not? So why not we have such a flexibility? It's not mandatory. It will be left to the individual student to choose their path and do the uh, credit accumulation accordingly and complete their program. Do you want such a thing in the physical education mode also? We will work on it. We will work on it. Greeting to you, sir. I am Ibrahim Mbo, an international student in SRCC. Okay, I just have a few things to put forward. First, it's about the reduction of credit hours of some courses. Looking at it, some of our main courses, the number of credit hours have been reduced. While the syllabus is still the same, or I can say maybe even more huge. While the number of credit hours have been reduced. Even teachers will tell you that, look, with the number of credit hours available right now, we cannot cover the syllabus. And at the end of the day, you'll be examined throughout the syllabus, meaning mm -hmm. students have to go extra mile to cover the syllabus by themselves. So with this, can you people please try to do something about it, whether as far as since the number of, since the number of credits hours are reduced, the syllabus to be compressed or something to be done. Mm -hmm. So after that, the second thing I have to, have to say is about Hindi. The, one of my sisters there just made mention, for example, we the foreign students, we are asked to do Hindi D. In that Hindi D, we are thinking about the scripts of Hindi. I believe even if it could not be way for us, why not they teach us oral Hindi so that we can know how to communicate with people and all those stuff. Because for right now, I'm just learning the scripts with some words. At the end of the day, I won't be able to communicate to people. So I believe it is somehow a burden on me. But maybe if I'm taking, if, if I'm given to learn oral Hindi, this will benefit me somehow in India. Thank you. Right, right. Um, as far as <laughs> as far as Hindi is concerned, <clears throat> many universities. You know, when I was at JNU, I am aware we have uh, language classes for functional knowledge of Hindi and other languages. Um, in fact, even some of the languages like Tamil are taught there, foreign languages are taught. Each university can have their own uh, arrangements for teaching, especially the international students, some of the local languages so that they can communicate well when they go out of the uh, university or within the university. And this is a common thing that happens even in international universities. You have to learn the local language. And um, in terms of uh, the compression of the uh, credits, reduction of the credits and so on, typically this is the internal policy of the university. Uh, UGC doesn't really say um, how it should be run. UGC only says that these many minimum credits should be offered to the students. Uh, so. It is something related to the autonomy of the universities. We don't want to have a uniform kind of thing across the universities other than the minimum credits. Good morning, sir. I'm really grateful for the chance to interact with you. I'm Gun Vadva, first year BCom honor student here. 
So sir, we got into SRTC after a very academically rigorous process of two board exams and then and a new exam altogether, which was CUET. And we did it all in the hope that we'll get to explore more sides of ourselves, of our personalities. But it was quite a shock to see that we have to study even for subjects in school now. That is seven. And uh, when you say that there's flexibility regarding the SEC and uh, VAC subjects, does that mean that it's not compulsory to appear for them? Because as much as the subjects sound exciting, it's quite disappointing to see that it all boils down to, at least in my experience, a uh, submission of assignments, writing exams, and just trying to score marks. Mm. So can you, can something be done about this? Um. We want to realize the dream that you have mentioned just now. And we are in a transition period. So far, our uh, higher education has been very, very rigid. It doesn't really care about the cognitive abilities of the students. It doesn't care about the interests and the needs of the students. It just says this is a syllabus and this is what you have to study and uh, pass the degree. And we want to change that system. And there will be huge inertia in the system because our educational system is one of the largest in the world. And it's also one of the most diverse educational system in the world. So bringing changes will take time. It is challenging and it's happening. And by the time most of these things are implemented, I'm sure um, your juniors will definitely be benefited through this. Let me also tell you, a lot of foreign delegations come and uh, meet us at UGC. And when we tell them about uh, our ABC scheme, uh, about our national credit framework, and the kind of flexibility that we are introducing, they, they, their jaws drop. They say, you are introducing so many such advanced reforms in your educational system. Even we should have those kind of reforms in our countries. So um, let us be optimistic. Um, I understand that uh, it's very challenging to implement all these national education policy reforms. But let us be optimistic. And in next 5, 10 years, let us implement them. And that is starting with your batches. Uh, you will be remembered when we look back as the first batches which are doing the uh, four-year program and so on. Uh, in the starting of your speech, you mentioned uh, freedom, flexibility, and choice as the major focus of NET. Mm -hmm. So, sir, my question to you is that uh, uh, on one hand, the university expects us to be part of societies and internships, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, on the other, ha uh, other hand, it uh, is mandatory for us to have 67% uh, uh, attendance. So, sir, how does uh, uh, these two things go simultaneously? Right. Um, you know, there are some contact hours that are required to have face-to-face -face discussion with the teachers, with your own peers. And that's why some minimum attendance is uh, prescribed. And also see that, uh, because I am also a teacher, I teach at IIT Delhi, we have also seen that there are diverse kind of students. Um, some students are self-motivated, some students they need a little bit of nudging, and some, some students have to be told, no, you have to attend the class, otherwise you will fail. So when we have such kind of diverse student body, um, just leaving it open that you either you attend or don't attend, it doesn't matter, um, that can affect a, at least a section of the students who may require some kind of guidance, some nudging, uh, some hand-holding, um, they will move away from the regular teaching learning processes. Is that, the, is that a good thing to happen? Certainly not. That's why there is a minimum attendance uh, that is mentioned. Um, and also, you see, whenever we make rules and regulations, it is, it is, it is for that small percentage of population traffic rules, for example. Most of us, we follow traffic rules. It doesn't mean that you can remove the traffic rules because anyway we are following. 
but you will always have a small section of people who may violate the traffic rules and that may cause problem in society. So similarly, even if a small section of our students deviate from the teaching learning processes and if they suffer, all of us have to be concerned about it. Right? So that's why there are some minimum rules and regulations with respect to the attendance. Uh, so as these SEC, VAC and AEC courses were introduced with much enthusiasm, uh, me and all of my friends chose very flowery subjects. Mm -hmm. But uh, however, the hasty implementation of the curriculum just not just made us being overburdened, mm -hmm. but all of us ended up learning little to nothing. So my question is, all of these uh, changes are very revolutionary. But is it fair that all of us are subjected to it all at once? And my second question is, with respect to all of these experiments, uh, with respect to uh, entrance exams and the new curriculum being subjected to us, was the risk benefit uh, of the entrance justified owing to the scorching heat in Delhi and the whole summer break being scrapped off and all the other great colleges offering summer internships and us as first years when we know that corporate life, uh, I mean, uh, expects us to have some sort of a internship experience. We aren't allowed to have it, anything at all. Again, uh, giving uh, giving uh, uh, heat to the 66% attendance. So, yeah. Yeah, right. right. Uh, first of all, you know, last two, three years, we went through a COVID situation and that is why there was a disruption in the academic schedule. And uh, uh, you know, some semesters are delayed, some semesters are compressed, and now two semesters may be running parallel and so on. Many things are happening. But hopefully from the coming uh, August, the academic schedule become more normal and in future hopefully it should be uh, the normal academic schedule. So then you will have your summer vacation and all those things. Uh, there should be no problem at all if you want to do some summer internships, etc. And um, you said that there are a lot of revolutionary changes that are being implemented, but they are not imposed. For example, when we say we have introduced four-year undergraduate program, it's not compulsory for every student. You can just exit at the third year and you continue to do your uh, three-year BA or BCom or any other uh, degree program. Only those who want to uh, proceed to fourth year, you can go. Similarly, when we said that you can do two degrees simultaneously, it's not compulsory, it is left to you. So there is still a lot of freedom, flexibility and choice to you. Uh, so nothing is imposed at all and that is not the objective of the NEP. And the third point I want to tell you, and this is something that all educational university leaders, vice chancellors, directors of the institutions, had to implement in their uh, institutions. We have now redefined the meaning of internship. You know, in, in engineering institutions such as IITs, uh, when we talk about internship, um, you know, going to IBM, going to Intel, or going to GE, um, that is how we think, industrial internship. There's nothing wrong with that. But now we are saying that, um, let's say you're doing BCom and you want to do an internship, you can go and work in a panchayat office, for example, spend a month there and see how technology is uh, uh, influencing the lives of the people. Or um, you are a BA economics uh, graduate, um, go and work with a small MSME and see how they do their accounting process. Uh, can you develop an app uh, for them to help that small merchant in, in a village or in a town? So all these things will become part of your internship. Um, let's say I'm an uh, electrical engineering uh, student. I can go and work in a court and see what happens on the ground. Let me give you one example. Um, I was reading about a a doctor who studied in Harvard, when he was doing his uh, uh, degree program, his uh, medical degree program in Harvard, uh, it is so rigorous, just as some of you are mentioning, all the time study, 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 no time uh, at all it was. And then later when they pass out, they expect them to become good doctor. Who is a good doctor? A doctor who can talk to the patient in a humane way, um, diagnose the disease in a proper way, uh, right? So 
the doctor, uh, he felt that when you are involved so much only in your studies, in your lab work, that human touch is lost. You become so mechanical when you become a doctor. So he decided to work as a bus conductor, for example. He decided to work as a waiter in a hotel, just to see what conversations happen among the common people. What do they talk about their own problems, so that you become sensitized. So similarly, whichever degree program that you are doing in your college, you are doing it in a very idealized situation. The world outside the college is highly non-ideal. So when you pass out and you want to interact with the rest of the world, a non-ideal world, you should be trained right when you are in the college by getting into, the, into this non-ideal world in a controlled way and gain the experience. So internship uh, is extremely important for all of you irrespective of which discipline you are pursuing. And my request to all the heads of the institutions is to take this internship very, very seriously and help our students gain a taste of the non-ideal world outside their college environment. Hello, sir. I am Aditya Narayan. I'm currently pursuing BA Economics Honours first year. So I have studied uh, my plus two in West Bengal board and later on I have given CUT exam and I am a science student. So first problem I have faced about the cutoff. For science students, uh, we are not able to fulfill the cutoff for many of uh, subjects of arts or commerce, that's all. So that was our first problem. And the second one, you are saying about freedom of choice. Uh, freedom of choice, and there we are not eligible, or I, I can say we are not you know good to choose many uh, random or extraordinary subjects because it's uh, not given to us in many colleges. And the second thing that you are saying about uh, doing research papers and sort of things, mm -hmm. but in case we are not even completing our assignments, our syllabus, so most of the time we were using chat GPT for completing our assignments. So it's really hard to do research papers, reading books, newspapers, etc. Right. And another thing I would like to say about ACC and BSc papers, uh, really the intention is good to enhance our skills through ACC and BSc paper, but uh, data about the students saying about 60% of uh, students classes are not being conducted of SSC and BSc papers. Many of the students went to far away for attending the SSC and BSc classes in cluster colleges. Mm -hmm. And also as these classes are going after the lunch and many of students those, uh, those who are residing far from away. So most of them missing the classes and ign ignoring this. So the intention of developing the skills of the students, it uh, not at all implementing in a well uh, manner in the ground level. So that's right. also right. Right. Um, there are practical problems such as uh, what he has mentioned, and um, it's the responsibility of the universities, higher educational institutions, uh, to look into those kind of issues and uh, come up with some solutions. Um, it will take some time, things have to stabilize, it will take some time. Um, the other one is um, about uh, the CUET that you have mentioned, uh, I'm going back to that question, um, is you see, in our country, the admission process is highly competitive. We actually don't select the students, we eliminate the students. Um, because there are fewer seats and there are large number of applicants. And whenever we do this, we want the selection process to be completely objective, in the sense that there should be no human bias, no subjectivity getting into the selection process. And that is why we use exams such as JEE, NEET. Now we have introduced CUET. Please remember that only 5% of the total higher education student body is the medical students. Only about 5% are engineering students. Nearly 70% of the students, of the 4.1 crore students, they study BA, BSc, BCom. And for them, um, the admission process is so diverse. In many universities conduct their own entrance examinations. Many universities use board examinations and there is so much of variation in the board exam marks 
And that's the reason why we have introduced CUET, so that there is a level playing ground for all these students. And you don't have to really worry about getting some 98 or 99 uh, percentage in your board. Um, even if you have a lesser percentage, you can still work hard and clear CUET. And what we have seen after introducing CUET, the diversity on the campuses has grown. Um, even a student from a rural background who, who doesn't have the privilege of studying in some of the top schools, even they are able to get into top universities in the country, which is very good for us. And I do understand that there are some practical problems in conducting the CUET. For example, last year we had some glitches. This year it went off, there were no such glitches, but there were some issues with students getting some faraway uh, centers, and that's the reason why we, ex we extended the duration of CUET to give the first and second choice cities to the students. Instead of concluding by June 30th, now we have extended up to June 23rd, so that every student will get their choice of the uh, city. And um, as far as uh, your uh, question, coming back to your question, that um, he wants to take uh, different kinds of courses, but they are still not permitted. Um, this is, this kind of rigidity within our education system needs to be removed. We need to become more open-minded. We need to look at the interests and the choices that our students want and open up our university education system. And I hope that universities like uh, DU, which is the most uh, sought after uh, university and colleges such as yours, um, I hope that you will come up with these kind of policies and UGC will completely encourage you uh, if you want to provide that kind of flexibility and choices to our students.